friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the ladies of the Catholic Association, bringing you witty and charming in-depth conversation on the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers and movers of our time. Conversations with Consequences is part of the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Our radio show is always a podcast, and you can listen by going to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts, or you can just go directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. Thank you for joining us again this week on Conversations. We are thrilled to have our listeners with us. You're part of the family. Later on in the show, I'll be talking to my co-hostesses, Ashley McGuire and Lee Sneed. We're going to be talking about Shia LaBeouf, his conversion story that he shared with Bishop Robert Barron. Very fascinating. But first, I'm very proud and happy to welcome Christian theologian Carl Truman on the show. He teaches at Grove City College, and he's also a fellow with the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Welcome to the show, Carl. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's a great honor to have you on. You are one of the most elegant writers on these matters that I know. Someone that I, whose work I follow a lot on, on First Things, uh, especially. I love your articles in First Things. They seem to illuminate my mind in ways that other people can't. So I thank you for that. It's very kind of you to say so. You wrote a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution. Now, that is a book that appeals to me tremendously, but I have to confess I haven't read it because it's over <laughs> it's over 400 pages long and my bandwidth is rather narrow these days with so many things that I'm doing. But I was uh, lucky enough to find out that you wrote a smaller book that distills, and you'll tell me if that's a fair way to say it, that distills your very long and erudite book uh, into a smaller uh, bite-sized version that I have just finished and I really, really enjoyed. It's called Strange New World. World, how thinkers and activists redefined identity and sparked the sexual revolution. So thank you for doing that work and, and putting it into a format that I could read and, and that I hope many of our listeners will, will pick up. So, Mr. Truman, to get started on, on your wonderful book, I'd like to say that I, it's about something that puzzles so many people, and that's the strange new world that we're living in. So many things that made sense for centuries, if not eons, have, so, have stopped making sense. And what you do, and please correct me if, if I'm not expressing things properly, what you do is you, you, you trace modern, modern concepts of the self and of human flourishing. You trace them philosophically to their philosophical roots. Yes. What I do is I look at certain, what I would regard as emblematic figures over the past three or four hundred years, whose who's thought and, uh, and to some extent their lives sum up many of the trajectories or the, the pathologies, the characteristics of, of our modern age. So yes, you, you've summarized it nicely. So why the self? Why is, why is our definition of the self, why do you put that at the center of this strange new world? Yeah, well, one of the things that I wanted to try to do was to explain to people that the various aspects of the chaos that many of us perceive around us today, the identity politics, the uh, sexual revolution, gender chaos, etc., etc., these things that, that come at us and seem to be fragmented and chaotic, what I wanted to do was to probe and see, is there something that binds them together? Is there something that gives unity to them? And my argument is that, yes, there is. And the thing that gives unity to them is the way that we have come to imagine what it means to be a self. Now, there are various ways of using the term self. We can use it to refer in a very basic way to, to self-consciousness, that I'm conscious I'm me and not you and, and vice versa. Uh, what I mean by self in my books is the sense of what it means to be a person, oh, what does life look like? What does happiness look like? What is the purpose uh, of being here on earth? Is it something that's given to me from outside or is it something that I have to make for myself? Uh, and my conclusion was that, that the, the modern self is really, uh, we, we really think of ourselves uh, in, in almost godlike ways, one might say. We create our own meaning. We create our own values. Uh, we see the world around us as, as stuff for us to manipulate for our own purposes. Now, even our own bodies. You know, if I'm born in a body and I don't like my body, I can have my body transformed through technology and through surgery to conform with the image of who I think I really am. We tend to think of other people as first and foremost tools or instruments that we can use to enhance our own happiness. 
before we see them as individuals to whom we have certain natural obligations or commitments. So the self for me is 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 the way of trying to to find some unifying factor in all of the the chaos that surrounds us. So the self uh, in in the old concept of the self might have been ourselves. We might have thought of ourselves as as place in a certain time and culture and family with a certain set of duties and a certain set of uh, responsibilities that came with our with our position, whether that was in society or family, and that has been replaced um, with something that you call the authority of our inner feelings and then to be authentic is to to be able to to give expression to that to to be outwardly what one feels inwardly and society unless society wants to oppress us and make us completely miserable it will go along with this with this need that we have yes i think if you were to chat to if we if we were able to travel back in time to the middle ages and talk to a medieval peasant and we would ask them you know who are you uh, all of the, their answer would be dominated by external benchmarks or, or, or external points of reference. They'd say they were born to a certain family in a certain village. They had a certain status in society. They were connected to certain other people uh, who they lived by. When we move to the modern world, of course, all of those external markers have, have either gone or are in typically a high state of flux. You can tell from my accent. I, I mean, I teach north of Pittsburgh now, but I'm not from the United States. I'm you know, 4,000 miles away from where I grew up in the United Kingdom. I, I'm not as geographically grounded as my ancestors were. Uh, when you think of the family today, in, in the med medieval times, the family would have been a fairly clearly defined, somewhat elaborate compared to many 20th century families, but a pretty clearly defined connection of, of blood ties. Now the family is very fluid. Marriage is no longer for life. Marriage has, has ceased to be uh, a bond that binds two people together for life, except in really extreme circumstances and has become a voluntary contract for the enhancement of the individual's happiness. Well, all of these things have weakened the traditional markers by which the early modern or the pre-modern person would have known who they are. Or we might put it another way and say external authority mm -hmm. has over the past three or four hundred years become weaker and weaker and weaker. And what has replaced it is the, the internal authority of our own feelings. So, so you would say church and family and state probably would be the three big categories of, of outside authority that people used to peg themselves or their concept of themselves on. And now it's our, our inner psychological life, possibly, which is, which is what, uh, what, what grounds um, our self in meaning. Yes. I mean, if we, if we should go back, say, you, you don't have to go back to the Middle Ages. If we were to go back 100 years, what would be the three primary focal points for somebody to understand their identity? You say family. When I grew up, mum and dad stayed together. There was a sense which whatever happened to me at school, I went back home. Family was always the same. I knew who I was. I knew what my role was in the family. The nation was a, a coherent, imagined community. People who were English, people who were American, knew what that meant. And it was a stable source of identity. The church or the synagogue, the, the religious community, that too had a continuity and a stability to it. Today, all three of those things, the family, the nation, religious institutions are in a, a state of flux. What we tend to do today is, is pick and choose our communities, uh, often depending on, on how we feel. Uh, if I feel sexual desire for somebody of the same sex as myself, I can be part of the LGBTQ community, uh, for example. So our, our inner desires have become much more influential on how we think about who we are and how we fit into the world. Now, in, in the book, um, you, you trace the development of this kind of thought and you start with romanticism, with the romantic period. Um, you, you speak about Descartes and, and that's interesting, but what really caught my attention was Rousseau. Um, I, I think I read him in college. I'm pretty sure I read him in college. And I'm, I'm amazed reading uh, your perspective and the way you, you distill his thought um, how much of that I see all around me in the way people are raising their children and the way they, the way they interact with others and the way they, they expect their life to play out. So if I could, if I could um, 
summarize, so um, for Rousseau, and from your book, identity, identity is the inner psychological life and society and culture corrupts the self. So man everywhere is born free, but he is in chains. And what's chaining him down is the outside culture, the outside society, which isn't allowing him to be his authentic self. One thing that strikes me very much is how this changes, um, how this affects the way we educate our children and what modern education looks like. Yes, uh, I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, I went to a very traditional English boys' school, and, and this is putting in a somewhat extreme and somewhat facetious way, but I would say the purpose of my education was the crushing of individuality to make me part of the team. Exactly. That's why team sports, rugby and cricket, were a very important part of the curriculum because the idea was you learn to be part of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, we had school uniforms, so everybody looked the same, everybody dressed the same. Today, and you see this particularly, I think, in, in American society, more than European, uh, the emphasis in, on education is on the child's self-expression. Education becomes a way of sort of, you know, whereas the school was a place for me to be formed when I was growing up, today we might put it in, and, and maybe this is a little unfair, but I think it captures something of the truth. We might say that schools today have become places where children are encouraged to perform they're encouraged to be themselves, to give expression to who they are inwardly. And that tracks back very much to Rousseau's notions of education uh, and uh, you know, child-centered learning, we might say, uh, tracks back to, to some of the ideas that Rousseau is floating in the 18th century. Many, many people who want to help children in the inner city, for instance, disadvantaged children, they, they feel that the best thing they can do for them is give them, the, give them a stage to express themselves on. I've seen that over and over again. Um, to me, who was raised very traditionally in, in, his, in Latin America, um, I can't think of anything worse <laughs> than giving a child a place to express himself because you don't know what's going to come out, right? Yes, I, I think you're assuming there that somehow, you know, with Rousseau, that, that it's culture that's messed up these kids. And if we can just find that inner core of pristine selfhood and allow it to perform, everything will be okay. I think, no, that's not what life is about at all. Education really is about taking raw material, we might say, and giving kids the skills to, to discipline themselves in many ways so that they're able to go on and become good members of, of society. That's not to say that we crush their individuality, but it is to say that, that kids who are taught that, no, you can't simply operate in accordance with your appetite. Uh, no, you can't simply do what you want. You have to learn to be disciplined. You have to learn the virtue of hard work. Uh, you have to learn to learn from other people. Mm -hmm. I think all of these things are part of what growing up and becoming an adult and becoming an adult who's going to flourish are part of. And, of course, uh, the church traditionally has played a significant role uh, in that as well. Okay, so after Romanticism, you take us through through um, a chapter called Prometheus Unbound, which I thought was also so so illuminating. You talk about Hegel and Marx and how um, there was, a, or I'm sorry, Hegel and Nietzsche, and how there was a, there's a there's this idea that we're not built with any kind of moral compass inside of us. There's no natural law, and instead, these are just ways of gaining power. Of moral moral concepts are just ways of one group of people um, dominating another. And uh, from Nietzsche, that a man must rise uh, to the challenge of creating his own self and his own set of rules. And, and that's, how, that's how you find human flourishing, not in accommodating yourself to a, a, a natural law built in morality that, that eventually will, te will take you to happiness, but to create your own set of, of rules and, and realities. Yes, I think what, what happens in the 19th century and the various influential figures who articulate this, but Nietzsche, I think, is, is one of the most entertaining, clear, and ultimately influential. This abolition of the notion of human nature. What, what saves Rousseau and the Romantics from a pure moral subjectivism is that they are committed to the idea that there is such a thing as human nature, and human nature has a distinct moral shape, which each individual possesses and is to act in accordance with if they're to flourish. Nietzsche comes along and essentially says, no, 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 that's a residue of Christianity. That's a residue of believing that, that men and women are made in the image of God. Oh, and by the way, you Enlightenment thinkers got rid of God. 
And when you get rid of God, you get rid of all of the, the benefits, if you like, that came with God, one of which is the idea of human nature having a moral structure. Uh, and so Nietzsche says, no, what we have to do now is we create our own meanings and our own values. And the supreme, uh, you know, the greatest human being, if you like, the, the one he calls the Superman. Unfortunately, that now has comic book connotations for us. But he talks about the Superman is the one who is able to transcend himself, mm -hmm. the one who is able to rise beyond the categories that society would impose on him from outside and essentially create himself. And in the book, I, I point to a figure such as Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, when people hear Nietzsche, they tend to think of, you know, is Nietzsche anticipating Hitler or somebody mm -hmm. like that? Like, what Nietzsche really has in mind is a, a, a supreme, transgressive, artistic figure, mm -hmm. such as Oscar Wilde, one who is the great individualist. And in many ways, that's, you know, percolated down to all levels of society yes. now, where we, we all have Nietzschean intuitions. We're all suspicious of other people's attempts to impose their morality mm -hmm. upon us, assuming that that's really a bid for power over us. Uh, our media tend to lionize uh, the transgressive or those who break the rules of the previous generation. Drag queens, for example, might be a, a, you know, one of the most controversial examples at the moment. What is a drag queen? A drag queen is breaking all kinds of mm -hmm. taboos, conventions that are established in the past. The drag queen is the great Nietzschean individualist when viewed out through that lens. And very artistic, they consider themselves, right? I mean, it's, it's the artistic individual. Yeah, they do. Okay, so that brings I am less us. Convinced, but they do. Yes, yes, I don't, I don't see the art very much myself. But there's a lot of kind, there's a lot of different types of art which, which leave me cold. So maybe it's just me. Um, <laughs> so the next, the next thing is, is the one that I think um, the next step in this development is the one that's got all of us gasping <laughs> since when we see the way things have turned out. But it's the, the, the sexual part. And here we yeah. have Freud, as you explain in wonderful detail. Um, explaining to all of us that the fundamental form of human happiness is actually sex um, and that he believes that societies do have to control sex because otherwise you fall into chaos. But further, subsequent thinkers um, say that, well, no, what you really have to do is destroy all the sex codes and take away all those silly old-fashioned rules and then there will be general human happiness uh, with all sexual um, desires fulfilled. Yes, I, I mean, I, and I think what we what we see there is very much you've described the, the world in which we now live. There's a sense in which once Freud makes his move and, and defines human beings in terms of their sexual desires or the sexual drives, it's inevitable that sex is going to get politicized because rules about sexual behavior become rules about who society will allow you to be and will not allow you to be. And where we are now, of course, I think a number of things have come together. Uh, but the, the highly technological nature of society uh, allows us to, to question that part of Freud, where Freud says, you know, we, we have to restrain things, otherwise society will fall apart. I think technology is, is allowing us to imagine that, that, that no, we don't. Um, you know, in the past, yes, uh, uh, rampant sexual activity would lead to lots and lots of unwanted pregnancies. But now we have technology to deal with that. We have contraceptions. Uh, contraceptives, we have uh, abortions. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, men behaving like women and, and pretending to be women, that, that was not really plausible or possible. Now we have technology that allows us to uh, manipulate our bodies hormonally and surgically in order to, to live out these fantasies in, in the real world. So you know, Freud, in many ways, looking back on Freud, he's, he's culturally a very conservative figure. But once you take his basic insights and parlay them into a highly technologized society, uh, then we see the kind of chaos uh, that's unfolding or sexual moral chaos that's unfolding before us at this moment in time. What I find disturbing with speaking to younger people uh, is that they completely internalize the idea that uh, that sexual that, that that sexual fulfillment is the highest form of human fulfillment. How did how was that so successful? What were the elements that went into that to make that such um, 
just such a universal thought pattern amongst people. Yeah, but it's, it's an interesting question. And here, I, I think at this point, you know, I'm, I'm going to draw on theology as a, as a Christian at this point. Um, first of all, I would say that it, it's very clear when we look at world literature that the erotic sexual desire is a very powerful component of what it means to be a human being. I say to the students, there's a reason why we can read the Iliad today, and it makes sense to us. Because the story of one guy falling in love with another guy's wife, running off with her, the, the first guy is mad and he goes and chases after him, that's still played out every lunchtime in America on soap operas, uh, the basic dynamic. And that tells you something about the power of sexual desire and sexual attraction. So I think, first of all, what I want to say that structurally within human beings, erotic desire and erotic pleasure is very, very powerful and has always been so. And then I would add to, to that, I would bring a, a theological dimension into this. And I would say human beings has fallen. Human beings as having fallen away from God and, and, and being sinful. Uh, we will tilt towards those things that make us feel godlike. Well, there is nothing more godlike in some ways than the sexual act, because that, uh, at least in its, in its original design, was designed... Uh, to create new life. There is nothing more godlike than a man and a woman do than create new life. Uh, that's an amazing thing. And so I think that uh, from a Christian perspective, I would say there is a tilt in fallen, among fallen sinful human beings in rebellion against God towards favoring sexual sin precisely because it is that which makes us feel godlike. I think Freud is right. Sex is the most satisfying pleasure. Why is it the most satisfying pleasure? It's not simply the physical dimension of it. It's also, you might say, the metaphysical dimension because it's it's a little taste of what it's like to be God. Hmm. Oh, wow, that's very <laughs> that's very strong, Carl, <laughs> and very yes, very true. Um, and it and it does explain the the intensity of our feelings around it. And and although we are, don't you feel we're hyped up on it all the time? by the, the, the consumerist culture. I mean, everything seems to be wrapped up in a, in a heavy layer of sex. And I imagine it, was, it wasn't like that before, not before um, ads of, uh, and, and music and the things that, that are constantly assaulting us. Yes, I make a point. I'm a bit of a Frank Sinatra fan. Uh, and I make the point to my students in class, you know, Frank Sinatra, if he sang about sex, it was very subtle. Mm -hmm. What Frank Sinatra really sang about was love and romance. Today, the pop artists of today, they sing about sex. It's brutal. It's raw. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not romantic. It's all about the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no wooing of the girl. There's no uh, seduction of the guy taking place. It's almost a raw consumerist activity that's going on. I think we see that uh, in, in pop culture. I remember being in South America some years ago and being quite struck watching the, the TV at how overtly sexualized a lot of the commercials uh, and the, the shows, the game shows were. Uh, I've noticed that coming in in America in the last couple of years. Uh, it, it's been very interesting to see uh, the sexualization even of TV commercials uh, becoming more and more significant of reality TV shows. So yeah, uh, I think you're absolutely right. We are we're soaking in it at the moment. And then, of course, we have Pride Month. Uh, oh. it, it's very difficult to walk down a high street with your, your kids during Pride Month and for your kids not to be exposed to some pretty sexually explicit images in shop windows or on, on billboards. And, and that's not to hit Pride Month in particular. It's simply to say that Pride Month is simply one manifestation of this broader prioritizing and sexualization of society. Carl, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted I wanted to ask you about your chapter, Plastic People, Liquid World, um, because you touch upon the the terrible, the state of people's um, feelings, the state of the, the states of depression, of suicidality, the yeah. way that we have so much more than anyone ever had in the history yeah. of mankind, and yet we're very unhappy. So explain to us yeah. about Plastic People, Liquid World. Well, the point there is that we're the, the, the plastic people is the idea that we can invent, we can, we can invent ourselves. We have to invent ourselves. We, have these, you know, we are psychological beings, and, and it's our feelings that count, and, and we're able to invent ourselves. 
the liquid world goes back to what I was talking uh, about a little earlier, about the, the fact that we don't have fixed external markers that we can grab hold of now to know who we are. And what that does, when you combine those two things, it, it essentially places on our shoulders uh, the responsibility of, of self-invention mm. without really giving us clear guidelines as to how to invent ourselves. Uh, and I'm reminded of Jean-Paul Sartre's famous comment uh, that man is condemned to be free, which is weird for Americans to hear because Americans love freedom. But what Sartre is getting at there is man is condemned to invent himself. Man is condemned to decide who he is to be. Well, and, and Sartre's right that that, that's not liberating so much as it is burdensome. To take an extreme example, I think about the transgender issue among young, very young kids today. Imagine being a three-year-old child and saying to your parents, Mommy, Daddy, uh, am I a boy or a girl? And the parents saying, well, we don't know. You <laughs> need to decide that. <laughs> Poor child. Is that liberating? Is that a terrifying burden? I think it's a terrifying burden. And that's an extreme example, I think, of a kind of phenomenon that affects us all in this world, that we now, we are, the demand is you will invent or create yourself. That is a terrifying responsibility to place on the shoulders of individuals. Well, Mr. Truman, thank you for giving us a whirlwind tour of our strange new world and how, how we got here, how we got to the modern self philosophically. Um, thank you very much uh, for our listeners. It's called Strange New World. How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Sexual Revolution by Carl Truman. Thank you very much, Mr. Truman. Thanks for having me on. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. For this part of the show, my co-hostesses, Ashley McGuire and Lee Sneed from the Catholic Association. Join me. We're going to talk about Shia LaBeouf and his amazing conversion story that he shared with Bishop Robert Barron. Hello, ladies, and thank you for joining me today on Conversations. So great to be with you, Gracie, as always. I love joining in for the team chats. I'm so happy to be here with you, ladies. And we have a great topic today. We wanted to talk about something that's very interesting, and it's getting a lot of eyeballs on the on the Internet, and people are really interested in this topic. And, and of course, they should be, because what happened was that Shia LaBeouf, the an actor who many people know from his uh, role in the Transformers. That's how I know him. I'm not a big movie watcher, but I've seen every child, every children's movie made in the last few years, in the last over 20 years because of all my children. He appeared on an episode with uh, Bishop Robert Barron where the bishop interviewed him about his recent conversion to the Catholic faith. And to put a little background on that, Shia LaBeouf has um, has had a very spotty, complicated personal history for many years, including some things that he describes as deeply shameful, uh, things like domestic abuse, all sorts of things that that um, would would generate shame and, and a great sense of sinfulness in, in everybody, but probably are very common in, in Hollywood. And how he tra- he he made this salvific journey. Into, into the Catholic faith. And it has lots of uh, beautiful elements to it um, that I think are worth considering from a Catholic conversations perspective, because um, if, if you're a Catholic, um, and many of our listeners are, you do spend some time being an apostolate person, a person of apostolate, or, or a person who wants to bring other people to Christ. And, and how do you do that? And sometimes you meet people who are who seem so far away from any kind of um, possible understanding uh, of the kind of mercy and love that 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 Jesus offers that you you shrug your shoulders and say oh that'll never happen I could never I could never explain to that person or or be any kind of shining and guiding light to that person because they're they're so in the dark and I I think Shia LaBeouf's conversion experience his his beautiful interview with with Bishop Barron is something that can help us rethink our apostolic efforts with people. Yeah, I mean, it's the classic Saul to Paul story, and it's as old as Christianity and as new as 2022. And gosh, we need stories like this 
more than ever because it feels like these days everything that comes out of Hollywood is just total sludge. Um, you know, I frequently marvel, uh, we don't have cable, but when I go places that have these channels, there's like 2000 channels now, I don't know when this happened that suddenly it's like 2000 channels on TVs and you can sit there and go through 2000 channels and it's all garbage. The messages are terrible. It's just Hollywood feels like a sewer. And so it, and it sounds like, you know, from what I've read about him previously and what I've read in these recent days with the articles about his life, that he was somebody who felt like he was living in a sewer. Um, and, you know, he uses this pretty intense language talking about feeling like he was I, I was actually struck by one of the things that he said was he felt like his only job was to bleed in front of people. Mm -hmm. So he says in the interview, my life was on fire. I was walking out of hell. I didn't want to be an actor anymore. And my life was a complete mess. I'd hurt a lot of people. News had come out that I've been abusive to women and have been shooting dogs. And I've been willingly giving women STDs. It's disgusting. It's depraved. And my mother is embarrassed beyond all imagination. Yeah, no, and that's pretty intense slang to talk like you're walking out of hell, but at the same time, it's believable. I mean, every Hollywood is so such a dark and depraved place. And sadly, you know, Americans are consuming more television and entertainment than ever before, uh, especially with portable devices and kids. And so it's just a wonderful story to see to see his his conversion and to see even just once a story of a man get pulled out of that be be rescued from such a dark place and what i really liked about it is the hopefulness it can present to somebody who's going to come across that story and hopefully it's the articles that are in the mainstream media are you know, not as, you know, hopeful as the ones being covered by Catholic media for obvious reasons. But if someone can come across it and see that it's not, it's not just that his, that it was this sinful condition, but it was the suffering caused by that. And obviously sin and suffering go hand in hand. Uh, but I think that some people experience a separation from you know, a life following Christ because they can't understand suffering and maybe they're, and they're already in the depths of despair. They're already suffering and they can't understand that. Whereas he explains that not only was he, he felt like he deserved to, to be part of this and deserved the love of Christ because just by the example of, you know, other uh, sinners who had gone before him, um, who had done such outrageous things and were still forgiven that his suffering could somehow be redeemed in the faith and I, I see that a lot. I see a lot of people feeling like, what's the point of all this if this is what, you know, God has served up to me? And I think that that is a very, is a very tricky way, a tricky, a tricky conversation to have with someone who is in the depths of suffering. And so even though he touches, I think the more sort of flashy parts of the article are this list of things about the dogs and the women and everything. I think the fact that he was, you know, suicidal in the depths of just darkness um, and then he found a way out, you know, could be applied to lots of different suffering. Sin, the way he describes the, the sins that he was living in do lead to intense suffering. They lead to intense shame. They lead to very terrible separation uh, of yourself from every good thing, right? I mean, if you're, if you're so depraved and, and living such a terrible life, where are your friendships? Where is your family? Where are the things that, that bring you joy? They're nowhere. And so he describes uh, having a gun on the table and not wanting to be alive anymore. And I, I believe in our society and in, in our modern culture, we are pushed all the time towards self-expression and, and being true to ourselves and, and going, you know, living our best lives. But sometimes your first conception of your best life is, is a sinful one, because that's also the, the, the information you're getting from the culture. And so you end up being sunk in sin uh, which then sinks you into misery, because to be in sin is to be miserable, because where is in sin, there is no joy, there is no togetherness, there is no happiness, no, none of that beautiful comfort, uh, the comforts of being alive and human don't exist in, in that sinful, 
abyss that he describes. Absolutely. And I think that that, that sort of sinful willingness to, to separate yourself from, from God and his goodness does create, you know, obviously we know it does create that kind of suffering. But when someone, say, for instance, you know, has a child, you know, suffering from a terminal disease, you know, and they have to watch the suffering and, and they haven't been brought up in a faith tradition. So they're, they're experiencing suffering that's not a part of, you know, a sin that they've committed. I think that that's a, a real highlight of conversion stories that needs to be addressed. And I was glad that this one, I think, touched on both, even though obviously they're intricately related in the case of Shia. And um, in Shia LaBeouf's conversion story, he talks about how he made that journey to, it's like moving to a different universe. He he starts to work on this movie about Padre Pio where he's going to he's going to play Padre Pio so he he starts to spend time with capuchin monks and he starts to uh, be uh, practicing um, the mass, how to how to do a mass, and how to listen to the mass, and and how people act around the mass and in the mass, and it happens to be in Latin, and that's another interesting point we can talk about too. His love of the Latin mass. It's like he he walked out of the darkness where there is sin and distress and confusion and despair and degradation and and everything that's low and sad, and then he walks just across the street probably to where there are people, men in this case, the Capuchin monks, living a life of of hope and, and high-mindedness and friendship and, and fraternity joy. and joy and the simple pleasures that our, our bodies and our minds and our hearts, we are made to experience the these beautiful, simple pleasures. I think he even brings up Sorry, cats and ice cream. Yes. Little things that I'm sure he wasn't able to even enjoy when he was, you know, surrounded by all that darkness. And yet in that cool world of Hollywood, what could be less cool? What could be less exciting or less, you know, fabulous than people having the simple pleasures of, of being a child of God and, and living in that in that beautiful sense and, and opening opening their, their hearts to that, that, that joy and that hopefulness instead of, you know, maximizing their intense pleasure sensations until you're living in that in that dark place that Shia LaBeouf was living in. What I found most interesting of what I've read about his story is is his time spent with the Capuchins and the you know a couple things one he talks about meeting one of the monks who had killed his pregnant wife and then became a priest and to personally know someone who's uh, you know, experienced, again, such a Saul to Paul radical conversion had to have really made an impact on him and made him think that he could start anew too. And that's kind of the fundamental Christian message is that it's like an actual rebirth that we're, we're born again in Christ and, and made anew. But also he, he talked about discovering kind of a masculinity to Christianity. And uh, yeah. I thought that was really interesting mm-hmm. because Me too. he talked about the feminization of Jesus in popular culture. And I think just it was a good reminder, even as a Catholic, of the importance of the priesthood and, and just the yeah. different roles that we play in the faith, men and women, uh, and not that we need to stereotype that there's, you know, uh, you know, masculine men over here and feminine women over here, but that those, you know, those, those qualities that they're, they're really important, uh, and, and clearly had an effect on him. And it reminded me reading that him talk about that and discovering sort of the masculine side of Christianity reminded me of one of the very few good things that Hollywood has ever produced, which is the movie, the mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah which is my all time favorite movie. And, you know, it's, it's the story of these rugged priests um, from a different order, but they, they were Jesuits, but it's just a story of men kind of grappling with the wild and with, you know, their faith. And it just reminded me of that. And that that's just sort of a wonderful depiction of the masculine side of Christianity. Again, the I, I never finished this thought earlier, but when Shia LaBeouf talked about how at one point he felt like his job was to bleed on set, how fascinating because that is what Padre Pio did. He, mm-hmm. yeah, he experienced the stigmata. And to your point about, you know, the, as Christians, we're sometimes called to these very sort of intense experiences. I mean, not exactly bleeding quite literally, but sometimes it can feel like that. And that really struck me as, as having the, the qualities of the sublime of an authentic, an authentic 
conversion. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting about how he, and uh, correct me if I'm misremembering, but something how he talked about how he hated the idea of acting um, or pretending, which was strange as an actor, to feel that way. Um, and I, I didn't I didn't quite understand it. I'm still thinking about it. But, you know, I think, it, I think it was in reference to his learning to pray. And, you know, when you feel like you're praying and you're like, oh, when he was talking about his bar mitzvah and just saying how he was kind of just pretending and saying the words. And well, certainly I think as Catholics, we know that there is a certain something, even when you're not feeling it. Mother Teresa talked about it, to just do it anyway, to just repeat the words, just say the words, you know, say a prayer, the Jesus prayer or, you know, a Hail Mary just over and over again. And, and maybe that's what leads to the silence that comes from it. Um, but it's not, it's, it's different than pretending and saying someone else's words when you are doing it with intentionality, even when you're not, if you're feeling low and not particularly prayerful, but you know, you have to do it anyway. Um, anyway, I just thought that was an interesting comment. To what you just said about Bishop Barron. And, and teaching him to pray. Can I just make a side note of, can you imagine being taught to pray by Bishop Barron <laughs> <laughs> and having Bishop Barron as your spiritual director? I'm like, okay, Bishop Barron, here's my phone number. Teach me how to pray. <laughs> because it is true. Like you could be a lifelong Catholic and really struggle with prayer. You know, sometimes that is a big struggle for me because I'm like, am I doing this right? There's no like guidebook. I mean, there's a million books that give you suggestions, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, you can get the feeling like, am I doing this completely wrong? No. Um, you start watching yourself or listening to yourself or becoming hypercritical and then thinking back to, you know, to the start and you can sort of trick yourself out of thinking, what am I doing? Which is why I need Bishop Barron to, yeah. to give you a pri some private classes. <laughs> do, you, do you hear that Bishop Barron? Can you please <laughs> come help us? <laughs> One thing we if we could get back to that is about the Latin Mass. He had to practice a Latin Mass, the old Mass. The, the, because that's the one Padre Pio was, was praying, of course. And Padre Pio had a tremendous intensity about the Mass, obviously, like, like most saints. But saints like Padre Pio, they, they were, they were, they were sitting, they were standing at, at the foot of the cross. They, sat, they stood at the foot of the cross with every Mass. Every Mass was the real sacrifice of the cross. And, and I, I thought it was very cool that he, he was learning, that he learned the Mass that way, uh, the way Padre Pio said the Mass, and then he went and heard a Novo Sordo Mass in English and, and was um, sort of horrified, I think, at the, at, at the way that things were so different in the vernacular. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, talk bad about Novo Sordo and Masses in the vernacular because they're, they're wonderful and they're fine, and, but there is a sense of reverence that, that we've lost uh, I think in many, many parishes and many ways that the Mass is, is, is said, and, and it's sad because you do want to feel, and I, and I think this worked for Shia LaBeouf, you, you feel that you're, you've stepped into a different universe, a different world, a world of reverence, of, of otherworldliness, where you're closer to the supernatural, and, and the, Latin, the reverence helps that, and the music, and the incense, and, the, and I, I just think that's an interesting point. And I wonder, I wonder if we've lost uh, a lot of Catholics because of a lack of reverence in the Mass that points to them from all their different senses and perspectives, that they are now in a sacred place and at a sacred time with our Lord. I think that's right and i think that i think that a lot of those gestures were probably made to attract people or to retain people um to make it seem more friendly and you know m guitar music that they're used to um but i think it's backfired maybe in a couple instances like you say well i i feel like well, i know we're out of time and uh, I feel like we basically we barely scratched the surface. I think it's worth uh, I, I would uh, recommend to our listeners if they haven't seen the the interview or heard the interview. It's it's very very interesting. And going back to what I said in the beginning, I do think it it might awaken in, in people um, a broader sense of apostolate of what possibilities are out there for people that they meet, um, and and how we can be those souls that that move that bring other souls to christ so thank you ladies for this thank wonderful you. team chat today every morning the catholic association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day items are specifically selected for a smart catholic audience like you don't let the world take you by surprise subscribe to our daily media roundup at the catholic association.org and now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy for me to be with you. 
as we enter into the consequential conversation the risen Lord Jesus wants to have with each of us this Sunday, when he will speak to us with challenging or perhaps even scary words about what being his disciple involves, what Christian faith really means and requires. He uses the images of a contractor building a tower who has to make sure he has enough bricks to complete the work, for a king going into battle, ensuring he has enough troops to defeat his adversary, to drive home the point. Jesus wants us to know the resources and commitment we'll need to build a life of true faith and the type of strategy we'll need to be successful in fighting the good fight, finishing the race, and keeping the faith. Jesus challenges us this way not to scare us, but to give us proper expectations so that we will open ourselves to receive the help he'll give to complete the building project of Christian life and win the battle against the flesh, the world, and the evil one. As we examine what Jesus tells us, I'd like to contextualize it within the life of St. Teresa of Calcutta, without doubt one of the great saints and most compelling ones of modern times, the 25th anniversary of whose death and birth into eternal life the Church celebrates this Monday. The saints are the living commentaries in the Gospel. Mother Teresa shows us how Jesus' words, although perhaps initially scary because they're addressed to freeing us from the idol that we can occasionally make of our families, pleasures, health, possessions, and even life, are actually the path of happiness, holiness, and heaven. Jesus out of love exposes the various excuses we can give to acting on the call he gives us by our baptism to be like Mother Teresa, holy as God is holy, and to love others as he has loved us first. He describes for us that our Christian faith is meant to be the most defining reality in our life, more powerful than family, material goods, comfort, safety, and even life itself. Let's ask Mother Teresa's intercession as we seek to follow what Jesus tells us this Sunday with as much faith, hope, and love, with as much courage and commitment, with as much joy and fruit as she did. Jesus gives us three conditions to being his faithful follower. The first is to love God above every reality. Jesus says, whoever comes to me and doesn't hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus must be our greatest love. The word hate in Hebrew doesn't mean detest, but to put in second place. Jesus, after all, calls us to honor our parents, not hate their guts. If he calls us to love even our enemies, then we're certainly called to love our siblings. The point of Jesus' expression is that we must love him more than we love ourselves or our loved ones. Jesus can't just be a part of our life. He must be the center. He clearly was for Mother Teresa, who was willing to leave her home in Albania and go first to Ireland, then to India, and then to the ends of the earth, because she knew that Jesus was calling her to satiate his infinite thirst for souls. Each of us, in a similar way, must put Jesus first. And this, frankly, will help us to love our loved ones more, not less, to seek their ultimate good and happiness through a contagious and consistent witness of a life of faith. The second condition concerns our willingness to suffer for Jesus, who suffered all for us. Jesus says, Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. We need to be prepared to suffer out of love for Jesus and others. Otherwise, we'll not be able faithfully to fulfill the journey of the Christian life. The clearest example of this is the martyrs, who are prepared to die rather than sin, who are prepared to embrace the cross all the way, because they knew that cross would unite them to Christ. We see this as well in Christian doctors, med students, and pharmacists who refuse to take part in any way in abortion, even if they might suffer professionally. We see this in people who stick up for Christ and his teachings even when they suffer derision as a result at school or work or in their families. We see this in those who sacrifice money and time to care for others and for the mission of the church. Mother Teresa and her missionaries of charity have never been afraid of the cross because they recognize that the cross is not so much a symbol of pain, but of the love that makes that suffering bearable. And they recognize that by uniting themselves to Christ on the cross, they're responding to his thirst and sharing it. The third condition is meant to help us find and place in Christ our true treasure. Jesus tells us, None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This seems to be a shockingly challenging condition, but Jesus was driving at something he said elsewhere in the gospel, that no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. He told us during the Sermon of the Mount and gave us a clear practical application of this principle, you cannot serve both God and money. 
unless we give up our love of money, unless we make the choice not to serve it, unless we sever the cord of being possessed by our possession, unless we become detached from them and use them for, for God's kingdom, then we cannot be his faithful follower. Here we cannot help but think of the rich young man who when presented by Jesus with the path to true fulfillment through giving up what he owned, bestowing the money on the poor, storing up treasure in heaven, and then coming after Jesus, chose his stuff rather than Jesus. Jesus says we can't be his disciple unless we're prepared to choose differently from the rich young man, unless we're ready to use all that we have in order to obtain the pearl of great price. This likewise Mother Teresa did becoming poor together with Jesus, so that she might better serve the poor and lift them up. This led to her this led her to a far greater trust in God's providence, since she wasn't putting her faith, hope, love, and security in the things of this world. And God responded. She became one of the richest persons on earth and what matters most. God wants to enrich each of us by that same wealth. If only we detach ourselves from the things of this world so that we might be able to receive it. It's tempting to try to soften Jesus' three conditions, as if he really didn't or couldn't mean them literally because they're so challenging. We're tempted to try to reduce the price tag of the faith, as if Jesus were running a yard sale and we can haggle the cost down to something we think is a bargain. There's no such thing, however, as a Christianity on the cheap, in which we're somehow able to have God and all our other gods too. It's not enough to be a fan of Jesus or a groupie of Jesus or a Facebook friend or Twitter follower of Jesus. To be Jesus' disciple, to enter into his kingdom, requires a hard and decisive choice. One has got to be willing, as Jesus elsewhere, to pluck out one's eyes, to cut off one's hands, if that's what it takes to follow him. We've got to be willing even to lose our life, because it's only the one who loses his life will find it again in God. Unless we have a clear idea of the cost of discipleship and are prepared to pay it, we're not going to be able to complete the journey of the Christian life. With great love, authentic spiritual fatherhood, and trust in us, Jesus wants to help us reflect on what, it, what means it's going to take to achieve the end and to will those means. And Jesus reminds us that while there's significant cost to discipleship, the rewards are so much greater. Jesus promised as much elsewhere in the gospel after Peter asked him, Lord, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. There's no greater promise than that. As we count the cost of discipleship and with God's help pay the price, we know that in return we will receive Christ, who is the pearl of great value and the treasure buried in the field, worth sacrificing all we are and have to obtain. Part of that reward, that super compensatory treasure, is Jesus' awesome self-gift in the Holy Eucharist. This is the fruit of Jesus leaving his Father's side in heaven, his carrying the cross, his renouncing all earthly possessions, his hating, quote, even his own life, that we might have life to the full. This is where Jesus strengthens us for the battles of life and gives us sturdy bricks day by day to become a temple with a high bell tower, capable through its peals of bringing others to worship God alongside us. The Eucharist, both Mass and Adoration, was the real source of Mother Teresa's sanctity. She summarized the secret of holiness by saying, The time you spend with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the best time you will spend on earth. Each moment that you spend with Jesus will deepen your union with him and make your soul everlastingly more glorious and beautiful in heaven. As we prepare for her feast and 25th anniversary of her glorious and beautiful birth into heaven, we ask her to pray that our union with Christ in Holy Communion may spur us to choose him above everyone else, to embrace him on the cross, to find in him the real treasure of our heart, and to help us to enrich others with that same gift. And we beg her to continue to pray for us, so that in our life we too may do something truly beautiful for God, and come to the place where she now rejoices with Jesus and all the saints. God bless you. Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com, and you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy, and you go with our prayers. 